How's it going, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. Today, I have Alan from BC Vault. You might remember a while back on my channel, I did a review of the BC Vault hardware wallet, and I'm a big fan of it. So welcome, Alan. Thanks for being here. Hi, Hash. Thank you. We're glad to talk with you again. I uh, love to follow your channel, and uh, you certainly are one of our favorite YouTubers uh, discussing everything around crypto. I appreciate that. That's awesome. Thank you very much. So I know that on the video that I made about BC Vault, there were some cool features that made you guys unique. But one thing I think that flew under the radar is that your wallet is really backed by the company that you're a part of, and it's a cybersecurity company. Could you tell the audience a little bit more about what you guys do in the industry regarding cybersecurity and why that makes your wallet different? Uh, yeah, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I think we are really kind of a different situation because we are not a company uh, that was established to, to do BC Vault. Mm -hmm. uh, we are actually a company that works in field of IT security for more than 17 years. Uh, and we are a distributor for big IT vendor names as McAfee, Forcepoint, mm -hmm. uh, Microfocus, and so on. Uh, and work with the biggest client in the region, meaning the whole Adriatic region uh, in this part of Eastern Europe. So we basically came into the idea of producing a crypto wallet because of all our previous knowledge we had for, um, I always say that's like a grandfather technology, uh, high security modules, uh, HSMs called, uh, as they are called, are used for many, many, many years in banking, for example. Right. And they quite um, similarly do what crypto wallet does. They actually sign requests and spit out signed requests. So mm -hmm. based on all this knowledge that we gathered in, in 17 years as a company, as the team of experts on each field, we kind of felt to um, be called upon producing another crypto wallet, yeah. which would actually be completely different. And this is why you can see we don't use uh, certain aspects that probably most of other wallets use, which are currently available on the market. Yeah, and I think that's that's a very powerful thing because I, I think that there, you know, while a lot of other companies out there, they have they have pedigree. I'm sure they have people that work for them that have worked in big, you know, IT security sort of environments. But yeah. the approach that you guys took to the BC Vault is so different from the other wallets that are out there. I mean, you have non-deterministic wallet, first of all. There's no seed phrase, right? There's no yeah. there's no central password right that's gonna govern everything right you have a bunch of different options so i know one of the topics we wanted to talk about today was um the different options you have for pins and passwords on your bc vault and that's one of the things that makes it you know that much more secure for you long term so would you mind going over for folks that may not know the basics about the bc vault and then dive into pins and passwords and and how all that stuff works yeah uh first of all the old rule says appreciate the first comers, right? So mm -hmm. we appreciate everybody that was first comment on the crypto wallet market. We research all the ideas, all the implementations and come up on the conclusion that a lot of things can be done in our opinion, better and differently. Right. This is why we decided not to use seed words, not mm -hmm. to use beep, because uh, on one hand, they're really practical. On the other hand, they have really huge drawbacks that we really didn't want to have. Um, first of all, all your wallets would be linked to, to 24 words. Meaning right. uh, if somebody steals your 24 words, not only all the wallets that you used up to today are compromised, actually all your wallets are compromised that you will also use in the future. Uh, future yes. Sorry. So um, we said, no, we're not going to use that. Uh, also because of the security aspect, mm -hmm. since you have to take care about 24 words. Uh, somehow, because those words get out, everything is compromised, everything completely. Yes. So we took another approach where we have a combination of a password on a computer and a password on a device, which is called PIN. And both of them together make a security parameter that is actually entered to unlock the data. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I'd rather start with how users think differently or wrongly about how this works. Okay. So, for example, you know, with passwords, there is a lot of 
problems. Um, you don't want to type in a long password on something like that because it's too small, it's too cumbersome, right? Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, you don't want to type password on your computer, which might be compromised. So yeah. what do you do? Well, we said, okay, you can type in something really long on computer, like Hasoshi is my top YouTuber. And then nice. just add a couple of things on the device itself. So you can do like um, down, down, up, up, right, left, or maybe just left, left, like just for example, yeah. pattern. So users think that if they're going to use a simple pattern like left, left, this is really simple and somebody could hack it. No, it's not because the password you entered here is combined with the pin you entered here and only mm -hmm. together they unlock the data. And you will never know if this part or this part is wrong. So right. you will just know that everything completely is wrong. So you see, you get the length here mm -hmm. and you get the off desktop security here. So even if my computer is compromised, somebody sees my password, mm -hmm. everything is here. They don't see my pin. Right. Or on the other hand, they see my pin because somebody is looking, they don't see my password because it's long enough, I can type it really quickly. Yes. But, but even if you take my password and even if you take my pin, you still cannot recreate my wallets because password and pin gives you nothing. You have to have the backup data of this device, mm -hmm. which is actually on the micro SD card. So yeah. you, you have to have all three together to be able to get access to my wallets. And if somebody manages to do that, meaning stealing your physical device, stealing mm -hmm. your password and stealing your pin, well, you know, then obviously yeah, it's your you have problem. greater problems than, exactly. than that. Yes. But even that was not good enough for us. So we said, okay, you know, what if I want to have a different password for my other wallet? Like I have my... Uh, daily usage wallet, mm -hmm. which is kind of a daily scenario. So I have a wallet which I use for purchasing subscriptions, stuff, goodies, whatever. Yes. But then I have my, 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 my Hoodle wallet, right? Mm -hmm. So Hoodle wallet uh, should be protected with something more powerful. More robust, right? yes. Exactly. So what we came upon is, first of all, you have a password and a pin to unlock the whole system. So when you enter the global password and global pin, you unlock the access to the device. But each single wallet can have additional password and pin if you want to. Right. Meaning you are free to have empty global pin, empty global password, and empty wallet password and empty wallet pin. So you just confirm, 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 and that's it. Everything yes. will work if you are really not security cautious. Mm -hmm. But then again, some people would like to have an option. So we gave them the option to use any combination of those they like. Maybe no password, just the PIN, which we mm -hmm. don't recommend. But yes. hey, it's your wallet. Maybe a long password and no PIN. You can do that. And then you have the wallet password and wallet PIN. So any combination of anything works. Right. So you have those basically have those four options. You have a global PIN and password. That's the first two. Yeah. And then you can have individual wallet pin and passwords. Exactly. So at, you know, at best, you have four layers of security that someone would have to crack to get access to one wallet, right? Exactly. And you miss one, it, did, it will not work. And you will never know if it's the password or the pin part. You right. will never know. And, these, and those, are, those are like key cybersecurity rules, right? Like you're... The feedback that you give, right? When you if you're when when you go on a website, for example, on your bank website, right? They try to take security seriously, obviously. Yeah. If you typed in your password wrong, you're gonna it's gonna say to you either your username or password is wrong. Exactly. You might go to another website and they'll say your password's incorrect. One of and those is more secure problem. than the other, right? And the, the one that's more secure is the bank that's saying, hey, one of these is wrong. We're not going to tell you which one. Because exactly. Every little breadcrumb you give a hacker is, is helpful for them, even the smallest details. So that's good. I mean, that shows your cybersecurity background is coming through. Like we're not going to give a potential attacker any feedback to work with, right? That's awesome. 
Yeah, I mean, the rule number one in security field of protecting the most important data was mm -hmm. always to, to have something you know, like mm -hmm. a password, and combine something with what you have, for example. So external device. Yes. But then again, you always come from the vector where you treat your desktop as compromised because yeah. this is the easiest thing to compromise, right? And this is why we separated field. So something you have on desktop with something you don't have on desktop. And this is yeah. exactly how most of the banks operate. They send you something on the mobile phone, right? Yes. Just because you have something here and then you have to type in the pin on the mobile phone. Yeah. This is the approach, exactly. Yeah, it's so that there, you know, separation of concerns. Right. Yeah. So I think the other, and I'll show a graphic on the screen that, that you provided me. And it's kind of like a, it looks like a big bullseye of like all the layers that you'd have to break through to get to the private keys on the yeah. device. But the one thing that I wanted to hammer down on a little bit more is the, the concept of, of creating new wallets on the BC vault, because I think people are very familiar with the process by which you create new wallets on a Ledger Nano S or a Trezor Model T because they have seed phrases, right? They're the mm -hmm. hierarchically deterministic wallets where you have one seed phrase and then new wallets can be created, you know, ad nauseum on top of those. Yeah. How do you guys approach it? Because you don't have a seed phrase, you're not a, a truly deterministic wallet. How do you guys approach creating new wallets and keys on the device? Okay. So it's really simple. First of all, one of the biggest security concerns for any kind of security device mm -hmm. is how you generate a truly random number. So that's number one. Yep. And again, we thought about that. And this is why BC World actually has a, um, a gyro sensor built in, which yep. is also used so you can turn the display. So if you are a lefty, no worries, works that's like nice. for lefties yeah. and then the righty, but that's such a gimmick, right? <laughs> Actually, this gyro sensor is used when you first initialize the device to shake it and generate a random seed that is used for random wallet generation. Mm -hmm. Meaning, whenever you click a new wallet button, you will get a totally randomly chosen private key address mm -hmm. uh, of the wallet, which is in no way linked to any other wallets. So, if you have one address of my wallets, you can never link it to any other address of the wallet right. at all. And that's good for, that's good for privacy also. Beyond exactly. Security. And then again, since those are not linked, we can do something else. From release 1.3, which was just released like a couple of days ago, a couple of weeks ago, I think, mm -hmm. uh, you can do delete wallet. And this is really unique feature, meaning... Mm -hmm. If you are used to use burner wallets, for example, for any reason, any particular wish you have, you can mm -hmm. do that. When you create a wallet and then you delete it, there will be absolutely no way to link that deleted wallet again to your BC wallet, except if you would restore a backup that had this wallet in it. That's mm -hmm. the only way. But yeah. once you delete the wallet, there is absolutely no way to link it back to your BC wallet device because you just deleted it. And now imagine right. you can create probably more than 2,000 wallets on BC wallet because we have enough storage to do so. And since you can delete them, mm -hmm. this means that you can practically generate unlimited number of wallets should you wish to do so. Right. And, and I think that's one of the things that really made the difference for me when I looked at the BC vault, because I had, quite frankly, I had no idea that the BC vault existed. And I think, I think I actually saw you guys for the first time on uh, my friends at the Crypto Authority podcast. I think they, mm -hmm. um, they had been in contact with you and they, they did a, a review of the device. Yeah, like, I wow, think so. That sounds cool. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the technology. And then I, I got to, I had the chance to, to use the wallet, which I appreciate, by the way. Um, Thank you. And the non-deterministic wallet structure is what really is attractive to me the most because while seed phrases are great for convenience, right? It's a convenience feature. Exactly. It's easy backup and restore. It's also, though, a compromise on security and privacy in some respects, right? A 24-word seed phrase, a 12-word seed phrase in terms of... Um, you know, like brute force protection 
it's enough, right? Yep. Yeah. It's enough. So that's, that's great. But then, as you said, you've got to store that somewhere. You've got to protect those words with, you know, with your life is a little dramatic, but with your life, because if they get compromised, your whole wallet is compromised. And so when you have something that's truly non-deterministic, meaning it's really random, that the shaking of the BC vault is just super cool to me because it's this clever way of coming up with randomness. Yep. I mean, you, yeah, it's awesome. you, you will not argue, argue that uh, it's truly random because, well, it's generated by you. So yeah, and you, you can't, <laughs> you take I mean, care you about can't that. possibly replicate a gyroscopic measurement exactly to the bits and bytes every no, single time. No, no, no. I, I don't think so. Uh, even if you would do so, uh, you would still get the different addresses because this is not the only salt that yeah. is used, right? Right. And so, again, I wanted to give this to, to folks who might not uh, be familiar with this concept, but all these inputs to creating a new wallet, right? These are called entropy, right? Yeah, exactly. Things that contribute to the randomness of a new piece of data through an algorithm are called entropy. So in this case, you guys are using different, multiple different pieces, but one of those that helps contribute to randomness is that physical world measurement of shaking the BC vault device itself when you're creating a wallet. That's right. Um, so it's an, another, a cool vocab word for people to use, uh, entropy. Yeah. Um, so the next place that I wanted to go is the concept of the backups, because I know that a lot of people, they were like, all right, so there's no seed phrase. How do I back it up? Right. And then how do I protect my wallet? Like in case I drop my BC vault into the ocean, it sinks, and I can never get back to it again. How do I back it up? And then I say, so there are a couple of options to do encrypted backups. One of those is the SD card backup. People yeah. are saying, well, then what if that SD card goes bad? You know, what happens? Is it really secure? So what can you say to those people to, to back up your backup process? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's one of the most legitimate questions for sure, because um, you have to take care about the backup of your wallet somehow, yes. if you don't have the BIP approach, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that relates to many things, but let's go one by one. So sure. first of all, when we created non-deterministic wallets, we had to came up with a system uh, to, to backup everything even though it's not related so how do you do that conveniently uh, we said well storing or sending the backup data directly to a pc a desktop it's not a smart idea let's keep these words separated mm -hmm. so we said okay micro sd card really cheap really you can buy it anywhere mm -hmm. and you can store a huge amount of backups on one even one gigabit micro SD card. Yes. So we, we included the micro SD card as a primary backup option. Mm -hmm. And the concept of backups is really simple. Now with version 1.3 again, you will have a notification that will let you know when you have to create another backup. And by the way, the only point in time when you have to create a new backup is when you create new wallets. Because mm -hmm. obviously each new wallet has a new address, right? So it's not related and you have to back it up. Now in the new version, you will be notified that you have created new wallets which have not been backed up to micro SD card. Right. So what this means is you, you can have unlimited number of backups on unlimited number of micro SD cards as long as you created a backup after created the last wallet. So this is the only reason to do new backup because some users get confused and they, they ask questions like, if I have one Bitcoin and I do backup and then I get another Bitcoin to the same wallet, do I have to ba do backup again? Well, I would like that approach, right? I have a Bitcoin, I spend it, I restore backup and I have my Bitcoin back, right? <laughs> that yeah. would be cool. doesn't work like that. I mean, you have to understand that crypto wallet it's just a private address or a private key, better said, yes. with a public address. And that's it. That, that's the only two pieces of data you have to back up. So yeah. because you just back up that, you can do them unlimited times to unlimited cards 
without any worries. All those backups will be identical. So what you do is you just create a backup, take another card, create a backup, take another card, create mm -hmm. a backup, and then distribute those cards anywhere you like right. to. But it's a redundancy scheme. Yeah. Exactly. As said, you have to do that every time after you create new wallets. Other mm -hmm. than that, they're good. No more backups needed. Right. But if you want to be extra secure, sure, you can create a backup to paper with the help of QR codes, which are then either stored as an image mm -hmm. or printed on a paper mm -hmm. and stored somewhere. But there is another thing. Some people would like to store their backup with the password, with the PIN, because yeah. they are they just feel like being ultra eber secure. Print out the QR codes, write everything down on the paper, store those QR codes extra securely, mm -hmm. and voila, you have exactly the same backup as 24 words, for example, where if you have 24 words, everything is there, no additional passwords and pins. So mm -hmm. if you will write down the passwords and pins on the paper, you can do that. But there is another option right? Mm -hmm. uh, you actually can change all your global pin and wall of pins to empty, mm -hmm. create a backup that has no passwords and pins, mm -hmm. and then change them back. Or just restore the old backup that has password and pins. Because right. passwords and pins are always part of the backup. Backup data is protected by the same scheme that all the wallets. Right. So if you create a backup, where your password is mm, simple, mm -hmm. and then you create a backup where your password is complex, and then you restore the simple backup, your password will be simple, right? Because right. all the passwords and all the pins are also part of the backup. So again, the flexibility of what you would like to do is up to the user. So you can do really, really complex things as creating backups with no passwords or backups with different passwords, mm -hmm. whatever you'd like to, your choice, you can do it. Awesome. Yeah, I think that that, that variety of options is, is awesome. And I, and I think it also conversely, then people are saying, well, what should I be doing? Like, what's the best practice? And what? Um, yeah, you know, how does it all work? And I think another thing is, for me, my question would be would be two things, right? So when you have these backups, they're encrypted backups, similar to the encryption I'm sure that you're using on the device. Is that a correct exactly. assumption? Exactly. Right. So if someone were to create a backup and drop that file onto their computer and have it sitting there, it's not like a, it's not a sitting duck, right? You still are going to need to be able to decrypt that with whatever, what is the password that you need to use to decrypt that? Yeah. So generally speaking, as I said, if you have the backup, you still need all the passwords and pins. So global password, global pin, wallet password, wallet pin. Without that, it doesn't work. Cool. Okay. So it's like an image of what's on the device at that time. Exactly. It's an image of Ephraim. So basically, all the data in Ephraim mm -hmm. could be accessed by professional by etching away the, the cover of the chip and reading out the contents. Yeah. They are labs that, that can do that. So this is the extra thing you have to be sure that everything that's actually stored on the device should already be encrypted and exactly the same with backups. So looking at the contents of Ephraim chip and looking at the backups, you would look practically at the same data. Right. And so for, for folks that don't know that, that Ephraim is a form of random access memory where the data on this device is, is stored and run through. Yeah, actually, um, it's um, it's quite interesting because it's called ferroelectric RAM, right? Yeah. And we had a question where uh, where a user asked, okay, but since it's ferroelectric, ferro means iron, right? Yes. So what happens if I put a large magnet to BC wall? Well, the good thing is that ferroelectric actually has nothing to do with iron. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look uh, uh, at the data studies that were made by Fujitsu Corporation, by the way, we use Fujitsu FRM, mm -hmm. uh, there is absolutely no influence of magnets or x-rays or whatever on the contents of FRM. So you can be sure that since we use FRM, 
-hmm. The data in there can be stored for more than 100 years without powering the device on even a single time in between. This is the difference to regular flash mm -hmm. that doesn't have this capability. And just as an anecdote, uh, I think I read last week that the Tesla, the old Teslas have a problem where they used flash to store some data in the main controllers. Yes. And since that flash got corrupted because of all the read write cycles, this yeah. is the problem of the flash. Well, they have to replace the, the, the controllers right now. So yeah. this is the real problem of flash, which many companies are not aware of. And well, not with us, we use the FRAM. Right. And I think that's because most, most devices that are built, are the, their average life is shorter than the life of the, the flash, right? So they're, they're banking on the fact that the device is no longer going to be used by the time that, that the, those components start to, to wear out and to die out. But now we have, you know, Teslas that are supposed to last basically until they fall apart. Yep. And uh, uh, hardware wallets, they're supposed to outlive you, right? That's the whole point. If you have your crypto on here, you don't want it to be a 10-year commitment. It needs to be a whenever you decide it's, it's over, it's over commitment, you know? Yeah, I mean, um, it's funny. But, you know, there's another story from auto industry with the same issue. Uh, I mean, like, it's more than 10 years old, probably. Mm -hmm. And this time it was Audi. So they built the flash controller into the radio mm -hmm. that because of some reason stored the level of the volume in the flash each time you change the volume. So what happened is that uh, once the Audis were approximately 10 years old or even more, and I'm talking about the top line like Audi A8, yeah, uh, the volume didn't work anymore. <laughs> so yeah, I, you yeah. know, that's th those are the examples that we knew about mm -hmm. and led us to usage of FRAM. So yeah, yeah it's real. The problems so, are real. Yeah, ferroelectric RAM, much more robust than true old old style flash. Right. Also a little bit more expensive, but yeah. you know, and, a little bit know, more expensive. Yeah, and and ultimately. You know, when people ask me, okay, what hardware wallet do I need? The first answer is always, you need a hardware wallet. Like whatever you can afford right now is what you it's should get. It's right? better nothing. Yeah. Get it off the exchange now. And then over time, find yourself your ideal wallet, right? Find what works for you personally. And personally, for anyone who's wondering, I've said it on my channel several times, but I use a Nano X on the go, walking around. Mm -hmm. And I have my BC vault tucked away um, in, in my secret storage place that I will never tell on camera. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think I, I see it now on the camera. It's yeah. somewhere behind you. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's actually underneath the carpet <laughs> in the corner of my room. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I mean, people are, are always stressed about, okay, well, I, I got to get a hardware wallet. And I've got to get the best thing now. You know, it's get yourself a wallet get your crypto off the exchange, and then understand what the options are, right? BC Vault's very different than other options out there. So evaluate yep. what works for you, you know? Um, exactly. Yeah. So thank you for clearing up the backup process and how wallets are created, et cetera. I think that helps people understand what's going on. There was one question that came fairly often on my video and i know that on on several other forums and and such also had this question if god forbid the folks behind bc vault including yourself were to go away or the company behind bc vault were to dissolve what would happen to individuals wallets would they still have access to their funds what what, what happens there yeah i mean that's a really legitimate question for any kind of crypto wallet basically yeah. Um, since we don't use BIP, it's clear that you cannot restore your backups to anything else but BC Wall, right? right. But that's a trade-off of security versus commodity. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a really honest and simple answer to that, which can be laid out completely open. Uh, first of all, 
B B C World was not made of com by the company. That's a startup just uh, to to see if they can make it, and then we can shut shut it down like in in a year or two and say goodbye, folks. Uh, whatever, we don't care. Yes. Because uh, our primary business is completely different. It's IT security business for 17 years. So even if we would decide to shut down the whole BC World project, we would still exist as a company. Mm -hmm. But still, then again, a huge meteor can hit uh, Slovenia or uh, a large part of Europe or the whole earth, right? But then you would mm -hmm. not care about your crypto anymore. Yeah, um, so <laughs> what do you do then? Uh, right? Uh, we can make it perfectly clear that there is no problem whatsoever for us right now to give out an open source utility that will enable you to unlock all your backups and get to the private keys. Um, then some people question us, why didn't you release such utility yet? And I will give you a really honest answer. Mm -hmm. Such utility would be a big shortcut for any malicious user or any hacker to understand how we secure the contents of FRAM. And don't get scared. We don't use any, any proprietary encryption algorithms that might have issues. We use all the top encryption algorithms in the world that are known mm -hmm. or uh, treated as the best. So we don't use things like that. It's rather we don't want to give up a couple of really, really smart security moves, uh, which we implemented in there, but things are even better. So whatever happens to us in a way where we would have to either shut down BC World or the company goes bankrupt, it can always happen, right? right. Uh, we will immediately release an open source decryption program that will decrypt all your backups and give you all the private keys. But we decided that since it's your wallet, some users really would like to have control about their private keys. I mean, mm -hmm. the raw private key. Right. So once you have the raw private key, you don't care about BC Vault, you don't care about real security, you don't care about anything because you have the raw private key. You can do whatever you want to with the raw private key of the wallet. There are actually two options. One is already accessible, but users didn't think about it. Mm -hmm. If you want to have control of your private keys right now, you can. So you ask me how. Well, BC Vault is unique in another feature. You can import your other existing wallets. What mm -hmm. does this mean? This means that you can import private keys, right? Yes. So if you want to have control of private key right now, you can generate a private key somewhere else on your maybe disconnected, uh, on your computer disconnected from the internet, which is really clean, uh, or you boot it from a CD image of a clean Linux system or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you just generate the private key. But you know what? A private key is mostly just the 64 characters. So you can just, yeah. you, you can do like boom, 64 characters. Mm -hmm. And import that into the BC Vault, and well, the wallet you have in BC Vault would be encrypted, and the private key would be encrypted, and you have the private key since you yes. just imported it, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, all these wallets will be always marked as non-secure wallets because the private key was already exposed. Yeah, it was exposed but to the open world already. Yes. If you are a super advanced user and want to have the control, you can do it right now. And you right. can be really sure that the private keys are the ones you imported. But the other thing is, right, but I bought this hardware wallet to be either secure and the private key has to be generated on the device itself. Mm -hmm. But I want to have it if I decide like that. So we said, okay, let's think about that really hard because there is no way in hell I'm going to export the private key to, to a desktop. That, no. That's a no-no. So this is why the utility to decode the backups is not a good idea. Because the private key will be shown on the display of the PC. And that's a problem, right? Yes. So we said, okay, I think we have a smart idea there. We'll enable you to boot PC Vault in a special mode mm -hmm. that will enable you to export the private key and see it on the display. 
And this is the first time we mentioned how this will work right now with you, uh, Forrest. So Interesting. Thank you. <laughs> what we will do is we will give you the private key. We will show it on the display. And we will mark this wallet as insecure wallet because you just exported the private key. Right. So even if your computer is compromised, uh, but you decide to export the private key due to any reason you have, you'll see it here. You can take the picture. You can write it down. You can do whatever you want to with this private key. It's your wallet. It's your device. And it's your security concern. Mm -hmm. But we will mark this wallet as, as non-trusted anymore because right. the private key was exposed. But you will have the option. So I'm sure that many people that had um, some, uh, uh, how would I put it down, some uh, like thoughts about not having the access to private keys mm -hmm. will now get the answer. So you want to have the private key, here's your private key. But we still thought about security and said, hey, we're going to show it here. Yeah. So even if there's a hacker on a PC, he cannot get any access to the private key shown on the display because the private key is still only on the device and only there. And right. it's good enough. You want to have it. You can write it down. You can take a picture. Well, if you do it with the unsecured phone, it's your problem, right? You did want the private key in the first place. But right. the option will be there. So yeah. no more concerns about what happens with your security, what happens with BC Vault, what happens with the servers, uh, if the servers go down. Mm -hmm. You will have the private keys. You can always import the private keys into whatever wallet out there. I mean, the native wallet of Bitcoin, the native wallet of Ethereum and so on. Right. And there you go. Once you have the keys, you're good to go, right? And it's a not it's not deterministically it. created, right? So you're creating a key, and then you know beyond that, you have the ability to then move that key out. If should you, you wish if you so, were, yeah. If you ever wanted to do that, and if you did want to do that, my recommendation is write it down manually. Don't take a picture yeah. on your phone because most people have their phone pushing all their pictures to iCloud. <laughs> Which exactly is insecure right yeah and write it down and then check it twice check it three times and then move it to a wallet pretty much immediately where you can keep it right um, yeah exactly right. so that that would be my recommendation secure i mean with wise. with bc vault it's even not a problem because when you've write it down you can reset the device you can erase it completely right after you do the backup, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and then try to import all your private keys back and you will see if everything works and then you can erase it again mm -hmm. and go back to your previous backup. There you go. Awesome. The test is done. Yeah. Oh, yeah, fair enough. So just from my understanding, uh, what are the... So what are the functions on the device that rely on your servers and APIs? Like I, all hardware wallet providers like Ledger, Trezor, et cetera, they have sort of their own servers that need to facilitate certain actions because it's just the way it works, right? You can't store yeah. all of that logic on one's computer or on the device. Yeah, so exactly. what relies on your servers to, to work and what's your security model for those processes? Uh, the thing is that with blockchain, with different crypto currencies, there are different approaches of how you can do a transaction. But mm -hmm. uh, let me take Bitcoin, for example. It's a really sure. good example. It's the first one. So people don't know this stuff. So this is really important to understand why we have to have service infrastructure and why you cannot do it with your own PC. Uh, even to get the amount of Bitcoin you have in your wallet, it's not a like to a Bitcoin network where you say, how's in this wallet? It doesn't work like that. You take the address and you, you have to take the whole blockchain of Bitcoin, which is amazingly huge. It's going to be a terabyte soon mm -hmm. and go through all the records, take your address and say like plus a couple, minus a couple, plus a couple, minus yep. a couple and do everything together, add, subtract, 
And yep. at the end, you will come with Hasoshi has 10 Bitcoin. At this address. On this address. And you yeah. have to do that every single time for every single new block that is happening every 10 minutes on Bitcoin mm-hmm. to even have how much you have on the wallet. But it gets more complicated when you want to do the transaction. Why? Because yeah. you, would, you would think that, okay, so I want to send a Bitcoin to, to hash mm-hmm. from my account. So I, I just take your address. I take my address and I say minus 10 to, to, to hash this address, right? Yeah. And sign. No, it doesn't work like that. It's much more complicated. So what you actually have to do is... First of all, you have to have this complete blockchain. So yeah. we said like a terabyte. You don't want to have a terabyte of data on your laptop for each nope. transaction, right? So you look in the blockchain to find up a sum of transactions that will give me one Bitcoin or more to send to you. Mm-hmm. So I have to find these transactions, put them together. This is called the inputs and say, oh, okay. This is enough. This is like 1.3 Bitcoin now. Yes. Please send one Bitcoin to hash. Mm -hmm. But also, users don't know that. Send the rest 0.3 Bitcoin back to my address. Yeah. So actually, I have many input and I have many output just to do one transaction. Yep. And And the accounting has to work out. Exactly. So this is what the servers are for. Mm -hmm. There is no standard there is no um, uh, a service that would provide you with this data. So this right. is why every single hardware wallet vendor has to have those services. We, with a couple of crypto uh, currencies, they do provide APIs to do things like that. So we do use those APIs directly by them, by the vendor, which is also the most trusted way to do it because mm-hmm. we are not involved. It's just the... Uh, the, the cryptocurrency server. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you must understand that the only data that we ever receive from you is the address. So your public address, which we, of course, need to find out all the transactions. Right. Um, and once we have the public address, we return all the inputs, we return all the transactions, whatever it's needed by the hardware wallet to do that. Mm-hmm. So this is one of the main reasons why uh, most of hardware wallets or or probably all of hardware wallets are not able to function without the internet because they you simply don't have the data you cannot do yeah. it you have to have the data yeah well and that's the challenge too is you you can't put a full computing environment in a hardware wallet because it's part of the reason why it's not secure you know it needs to be cold so yeah exactly yeah and so, that's an uh, engineering challenge for sure yeah i mean if you look at the from perspective of just supporting uh, top 10 major cryptocurrencies, uh, you have to have server capacity of probably around three terabytes right now. I mm-hmm. think even more, it's like more even five terabytes. So imagine the, the, the server capacity and database capacity you have to have just to, just to support the, the most simple things as how much Bitcoin do I have? Even that's not simple. So you have to do that in the backend. For sure, for sure, and that's that's a challenge, you know, that's yeah. prevalent across all all providers. Is how do we how do we get this done for our customers? And and that's why, yeah. you know, I see a lot of people that get angry because the the development of new cryptocurrency support on wallets is slow. It's slow because now you know it's <laughs> right. You know, yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, I mean. If if we go for EOS, for example, which was just supported in the latest release, mm-hmm. uh, that's such a complicated cryptocurrency compared mm-hmm. to, or, or better crypto ecosystem, not a currency, right? That's an ecosystem. Uh, it's a virtual machine. So mm-hmm. you you don't support send, receive, and and how much I have balance, right? You have stake RAM, unstake mm-hmm. RAM, stake CPU, unstake CPU. And then you have network, stake network, unstake network. Yeah. So those are really complex operations where you have to implement everything for one single cryptocurrency. So right. this is why it takes so much time, people. Don't be mad at us. Mm-hmm. It, we are just the developers, right? We have to ingest all this code that somebody else made 
and mm-hmm. and make somehow make it user friendly, which is sometimes really tough. Definitely. So, I think that brings us into our, our a couple of our last topics for the day, and that is you guys just started really you just just released the EOS software, right? Or are about yeah. to. Yeah, we did. We did. We did. It, okay. it was cool. released in one point three. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I thought so. Um, so that that's full EOS support, right? That's not just store and send EOS cryptocurrency. That's that's staking. That's full implementation. So you can use your wallet as the custodian. Like you become your own custodian for doing things on the the EOS network. And that's something yep. that's fairly unique. I don't know off the top of my head how many wallets have done that. I mean, EOS was quite a challenge. And if you look at the competition, you will see that if you if you try to do stuff with EOS, mm-hmm. you will have to leave main application. So like do something in the application and then open this another one that yes. will somehow communicate with the device. We don't like that. We said, no, native app support. Mm-hmm. So we want to have EOS in the native app of BC World, should work in the native app of BC World. And that was a pain. And not <laughs> only pain, there is a couple of things with EOS which still are quite different than everything else. For example, you cannot create an EOS account like do new account like that. No, yeah. it's not doable. Why? Because each EOS account requires a minimum of network, CPU, and RAM resource. Right. And this means that somebody has to give you network, RAM, and CPU, right? Yeah. So for your first wallet, even when you create it in a BC wallet, you have to use a service or a friend or a friend that already has an EOS account mm-hmm. to send you network, CPU, and memory. So the process is like create a wallet. Those are your public keys, which you have to use with the create wallet service. Uh, there are many services on the internet, or you can use a friend with EOS. And once a friend will send you memory, CPU, and network, your wallet will be activated in the BC Wallet environment. But right. the good thing is that once you have one EOS wallet, you can do that for yourself for any other EOS wallet. So once you will create another wallet in EOS and you will come to the point where it will say, okay, now you have all, everything is prepared. Please go and activate the wallet. You just go to your existing wallet in BC Wall, say, send some EOS to this wallet and the system will recognize it as a new wallet and ask you if you want to create this EOS wallet with resources. You will come up with a big pop-up screen with a lot of parameters where you can fine tune network, CPU, and RAM, and how much EOS you want to send. But don't worry, everything will be set by default to values that work. Mm-hmm. You confirm it, and voila, you have your second EOS wallet, and so on. So right. um, those were the challenges. Yeah, creation, wallet creation doesn't exist with Bitcoin or, or, or Ethereum and so on. Yeah, I mean, so those little known things, like those, those challenges that people face behind the scenes, I think are often forgotten when wallets yeah. come I mean, in front. You know, there are things like famous, I will say famous EOS sliders in our company because the EOS sliders that give you option to stake and unstake ROM or CPU Mm -hmm. were really problematic because we wanted to make them user-friendly. Meaning you might have um, five megabytes of ROM or you might have 0.5 kilobytes of ROM but the slider should still give you normal sliding operation where you can pick between whatever you have yeah. on a good scale. So that was quite a challenge and nobody ever will notice that. But trust me, people here got frustrated by sliders. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's always the little things, the details that are a challenge. If, but. if you care about the user, it's always a challenge, yeah. We could Definitely. have an input box, right? So who cares about the sliders? Just input box and type in your numbers. Yeah, no, yeah. no, no, not good enough for us. Do the sliders. Well, if the user wants the input box, he can enable advanced feature, manual entry, and type in the numbers. No problem. Yeah. But that's for advanced users. But make it, yeah, make it available for everybody to use. Exactly. So the last thing that we wanted to, to touch on today was you guys have a hardware announcement. 
that you wanted yeah. to make about the new case style. And I've gotten the chance to use this case. And again, thank you very much for sending that to me. Um, Hope you like it. Yeah, love so, it. It's awesome. And I'll, I'll post a photo too on this video when I post it. Yeah. I mean, uh, many users had a concern of uh, where is that? I mean, the wallet looks good. It's sleek. Um, but they said, like, it's a little bit light. Uh, it's plastic. So we, we said, yeah, right. I mean, um, most of the users would not even mind. So uh, it's it, it's good enough plastic. It's not soft. You cannot bend it, right? Yeah. But some users wanted a little bit more. So yeah. we said, well, no problem. You know, in Slovenia, there's a lot of skilled people that have CNC machines and everything else. Yep. And uh, as the complete wallet is produced in Slovenia, uh, there is an aluminum cased version. So this is a durable aluminum. Yeah, which is, it's quite Perfect heavy. Chest, man. It's it's quite heavy. It's completely aluminum. Uh, I would say you can drive over it. It's hard enough to do it. Maybe the screen would crack if you have really strange tires Dense or something. Tires, yeah. Uh, but but the wallet would function. Uh, and that will be available in our web store really soon because right now we already have uh, all the parts to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, we take great care of how this aluminum version should look like. So it's a brushed aluminum in mm -hmm. either a, a normal natural color or a black gunmetal one, especially mm -hmm. for me. I like the black uh, gunmetal version. And then you will have a possibility to do personalization with laser. So nice. it's, it's perfect graphics. You probably saw that on your wallet. Yep. So uh, there you have it. You want to have an option. There's your option. It yeah. will be a little more, more expensive because the slack of aluminum is not really as cheap as plastic. Yeah. Uh, but hey, you want to have it, it will be available. Yeah. So if you want to add a little more durability to the mix, then it's your, your option, right? Yeah, I mean, you can have one as a really eber backup device which you store somewhere safe and then one for your daily operations because, you know, ah, good point to mention, if you make a backup here, and restore it here while you have two devices with same wallets, which you can use, right? Yeah. There's it's no problem at all to do it because as we said, this is only the storage of private keys. So don't worry, whatever you do here will be shown here is the same stuff. So yeah. you can do that and you can use two devices. And uh, I think we should just touch one more point. Um, sure, and that would be a question for some users that openly ask us, why didn't you release open source of everything you made? Mm -hmm. So that's really easy. Uh, first of all, we didn't recycle open source code uh, as many other wallets did, for example, from one of the pioneers, Trezor. We mm -hmm. didn't take their code and do something and just release new wallet. Everything is written by ground up. Mm -hmm. Everything is written by us. And we decided up to this point, we're not going to do open source release of the firmware uh, mm -hmm. because, first of all, that would expose any shortcuts or any, any knowledge we use to, to the bad guys too. Mm -hmm. And the second reason, while we did put a lot of effort into it and we appreciate all the open source effort, but there's really a lot of effort into it which might be um, compromised if somebody would just take the intellectual property for their own advantage, for example. Mm -hmm. So business case, right? Yeah. And the third thing is, well, you know, you might say that, uh, how should I trust you guys when, the, when this is not open source? So I don't know what you put into the code. Uh, yeah, that's a legitimate point. But, um, you know, is your laptop open source? Is your yeah. firewall open source? Is your switch open source is your whatever you use open source well it's not so if you come from the perspective of it security mm -hmm. where we came from like i mentioned high security module devices in the banking industry there is no open source for hsm devices right simply because of the open source might pro might provide shortcuts for hackers find any holes whatever Mm -hmm. which happened with a couple of vendors. I will not mention any names, but there is even more terrible point, and this is really the last point, mm -hmm. of the double-edged sword, which is called open source, which, by the way, I love open source in some cases, 
Right. And this is called cloning. If I give you open source firmware of BC Vault, mm -hmm. really easy to add one line to it where every private key will be sent to somebody else, mm -hmm. compile it, and somehow secretly put it on the device and yeah. give it to you. For sure. And yeah. we will never be able to prevent that. And because if you don't have the source and you would try to do rogue firmware, there would have to be tremendous effort to simulate everything with you. And you will have much bigger problems to do it. So simply said, for now, for now, mm -hmm. open source, no, because of security concerns. That might change in the future at some point. Right. But right now, it's like that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it comes down, it does come down to trust. I think people have, yeah, trouble, I mean, people have trouble compartmentalizing that in this space. And I understand why, because there's so many yeah. like scams and things that happen. But I think, at least from my perspective, your open sourcing, like there's no real, there's, there's no real, there's no real setup here that says this has to be open source because I, I think there are a lot of security concerns because you guys do things differently than yeah. you know, other wallet providers do. And there's, I think a lot more, like if you were to expose how you create the wallets, I think that that's a big risk, right? It, it, you know, it's, it's not risk per se, but you will give clues that otherwise would take a lot of time to be right. found right. out because at the end, if somebody decides to, they can always get to the firmware. They can do the decompiling of firmware. They can yeah. take a really lot of time and do that manually. But it's only, everything is about time. So you just don't want to provide shortcuts in security. For sure. And this is the sole reason. No shortcuts. And if you look at the top competition used uh, in crypto wallets, it's not open source. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So Yeah, it's not open source. Totally I mean, get you. <laughs> that's um, it. That's it, man. But all right, so we're we're coming up on the hour mark. Uh, we might have even yep. passed the hour mark already. Um, but I did want to say, first of all, to everybody, thank you very much for watching this video. Second of all, we're going to do a giveaway today. Yep. Awesome. So I wanted to tell everybody that if you leave a comment down below about the key features that you are looking for in a wallet, right? What are the top two, top three features that you need out of a hardware wallet? And maybe what are some of the things that you see in a hardware wallet that you don't like? Let us know down in the comments below and we'll pick some random winners to win BC Vault hardware wallet. And so big thank you to the BC Vault folks for, for being kind enough to send some of the folks in the audience their own wallet to use. Yeah, what well, can I say? Thank you very much, Hisoshi. I mean, uh, people follow that guy. Uh, it's an honest, truthful, respectful, and totally calm review of crypto <laughs> space, which we really appreciate in the flooding of everything that's happening. And be sure that there is no problem of sending any criticism to us, any questions mm -hmm. that uh, might concern you. Uh, we are glad to have this opportunity to explain all the security features and everything because there are a lot of misconceptions about them. And I'm sure that with your help and this video, people will now understand that there are a couple of things that we do with a reason uh, just mm -hmm. because we care about our users. So it's no other reason, but just because we care about the end user and simply we have to care about the novice user as much as we have to care about the advanced user. We try to Certainly. be friendly for both. Awesome. Yeah, and I super appreciate you coming and, and uh, addressing some of the questions that people had and talking through how your wallet works because it is different than a lot of the other wallets that are out there and have been widely explained. So it definitely helps people that might be trying to decide what wallet they want and what's important to them. So again, let us know in the comments below what you like in a wallet, what you don't like in a wallet, any feedback, criticism, positive stuff that you want to send along to BC Vault and make sure they see it. And again, thank you very much to Alan for being here. And thank you to you, the audience, for watching this video. Have a great one, guys. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.